On August 15, 2008, a mother dropped her five-year-old son off to visit his father for the weekend. Her ex, Ernesto Gonzalez, hadn't been very involved in their son Giovanni's life since their separation three years prior, but he recently started making an effort to have a relationship with the boy. Daisy Colon packed Giovanni's backpack with clothes and dropped him off in nearby Lynn, Massachusetts. But when she came back two days later to pick him up, her little boy was gone. An investigation was launched and police even eventually secured a confession. The problem? Investigators didn't believe it. Daisy believes Ernesto hid their son somewhere, but nearly 15 years later, no one has found him. What happened to Giovanni Colon Gonzalez? When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of Giovanni Colon Gonzalez. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. everyone welcome back thank you so much for joining us once again this week's episode is another patreon suggestion this one is from jesus r so jesus is actually a longtime listener and he's the one who suggested the jesus de la cruz episode to us oh okay yeah because he was friends with jesus back in the 90s in lynn massachusetts when he was a little kid And today's case, uh, the one of Giovanni, took place in Lynn as well, so he thought that we should cover it, because it's a weird one. And it's going to be hard, too, because Giovanni was a sweet five-year-old boy with the Spider-Man sandals who was just going to visit his dad and then never came home. Mm. So let's begin the story of Giovanni Colon Gonzalez. Yeah, I have so many questions from that intro, so... (laughs) We'll get to all of them. Giovanni Ernesto Colon Gonzalez was born in Beverly, Massachusetts on May 1st, 2003 to Daisy Colon and Ernesto Gonzalez. Giovanni was the couple's only child, though Ernesto had children from previous relationships. I don't know much about Ernesto and Daisy's relationship, but they separated when Giovanni was two, and I don't think they were ever married from what One article that I read, it sounds like they never even really seriously dated. They were kind of, you know, casually dating. She got pregnant. She told Ernesto and they tried to give it a go, um, but ultimately it didn't work out. Ernesto moved to Lynn, Massachusetts after the separation, which is less than 10 miles from where Daisy and Giovanni lived, along with Daisy's younger daughter, Angie, in East Boston. So Daisy ended up having another child with somebody else uh, about three years after Giovanni was born. So she, the little girl, was about two when all this was happening. Despite staying local, Ernesto wasn't very involved in Giovanni's life. And this is kind of what I mentioned in the intro, that this changed in 2008 when Ernesto asked for visitation with his son. What was the sudden change? So I actually couldn't find that for a long time. I had to get really deep in my research before I found the precipitating events to this. So yeah, like we'll we'll get into it in just a second. Even though they didn't have a, like a custody or visitation agreement, Daisy was willing to give it a try. And Giovanni had spent the weekend with his father twice prior to this incident without any issues. Now, Daisy did have some concerns about Ernesto being in Giovanni's life, but she was willing to go for it, saying, quote, the relationship between Giovanni and him was not about me. It was about a little boy who wanted his father in his life, end quote. Now, the alleged reason Ernesto dropped out of Giovanni's life for a time could have possibly foreshadowed what was to come. And again, this is the part that I couldn't find for a while, and Daisy really doesn't give details, but she did tell reporters that she and Ernesto disagreed on disciplining Giovanni. 
And in 2007, she told him that he couldn't see their son until he got counseling. And he didn't. He didn't see Giovanni for over a year. Counseling for like anger management? Don't know. That's Mm. all it says. So it was over a year later in 2008 when he asked to restart visitation. And when he did, Daisy was naturally wary. According to court records, when these conversations started up, she warned Ernesto to keep his word about visitations and told him that if he messed up, she would make sure he wouldn't be able to see Giovanni again. She was just, you know, trying to protect her son, and she just didn't want this guy, like, coming in and out of his life. On Friday, August 15th, 2008, Daisy dressed Giovanni in jeans, a red t-shirt, and Spider-Man sandals. She packed his Transformers backpack with clothes and toys and dropped her son off at his father's apartment in Lynn. On the evening of Sunday, August 17th, Daisy returned to the apartment to pick her son up as scheduled, and this is around 4 o'clock. She knocked on the door, but there was no response. Daisy eventually called police, who arrived on scene. They were able to make entry into the apartment, which I, it sounds like he never answered the door and eventually like one of them got through a window or something. It seemed like it was kind of a, a big production. Mm. And Ernesto was inside, had been inside the entire time, but Giovanni was not. Okay, <laughs> so what was Ernesto doing? Like just sitting there. So, and this is where things start to get bizarre. So, of course, police go in and they're like, hey, where's Giovanni? And he said, oh, I haven't seen him since last weekend. What? Yeah. Like, just straight up said that he had never been there that weekend. Okay. But Daisy did actually, like, see him go go with his father or into his father's apartment or something, right? Yeah, like she literally took him to the apartment door, knocked on the door, Ernesto answered. Yeah. They did the exchange. Okay, so it wasn't anything weird like she dropped him off like it outside. No, watched no. Watched him walk into the building, but not necessarily no, into the apartment. Nothing like that. Okay. And so yeah, this whole like I haven't seen him in over a week was very obviously not true. And luckily police believed Daisy's account over Ernesto's. So Ernesto was arrested and charged with child endangerment. Good. Yes. Police didn't issue an Amber Alert for the little boy, though, because Massachusetts was one of the states that required proof of a kidnapping, including a vehicle description. Did they issue... Is there some other level of alert that they issued? Yeah, it's called an Endangered Child Alert, and they did issue that. By the next day, Monday, local media outlets were beginning to pick up the story. Ernesto's cousin, Tracy Contreras, told reporters that her cousin was a good man and would never hurt his children. And to be fair, like this does seem to be true. Even Daisy that day said that she had never witnessed Ernesto being abusive toward Giovanni. And according to everyone, like he seemingly had no history of violence toward any of his children. I mean, maybe he didn't do any harm to him. But clearly he's somewhere, so like... But Ernesto wasn't talking. He was arraigned that Monday and pleaded not guilty, but was not cooperating with police. Lynn police brought in the Massachusetts State Police right away, and they began scouring the neighborhood and interviewing neighbors to see, you know, if anyone had seen Ernesto and Giovanni together over the weekend. And they did find that people had seen them. Okay. Which, you know, not surprising because we already knew. Right. Like, he we was knew there. he was there. Right. Two of Ernesto's neighbors saw Giovanni playing outside with a ball as his father stood nearby. According to witnesses, quote, the boy kicked the ball down the side of Brightwood Terrace and Gonzalez cursed the boy in Spanish, end quote. The East Boston neighborhood where Daisy and Giovanni lived was very close knit and the neighbors there held vigils for the missing boy. They also described Daisy as a great mother who loved Giovanni. But as the first week of the investigation drew to a close, there was still no sign of the five-year-old, and police made a disturbing discovery. (music) 
and I'll get more into details of the searches, you know, as we go on. But I, I will say like that first week, they did do basically what you would want them to do. I mean, they canvassed, they searched the surrounding areas, you know, all of that type of stuff. They tried to talk to Ernesto, though he didn't talk to them. You know, Daisy cooperated fully. They obviously, you know, they were talking to relatives, friends, the whole thing. Good. So we're not bashing police this episode? Um, No, not necessarily. <laughs> We might bash the DA toward the end, but that's later. <laughs> and that's fine. So after searching Ernesto's apartment early on, you know, we're talking in the couple of days after Giovanni went missing, police discovered bloodstained objects inside. Okay. These objects included a mop that appeared to have been stained with blood and then cleaned with bleach, which of course made everyone's... Yeah. Heart drop. Right. Also no DNA. And to make things worse, Ernesto had a cut on his hand that he was refusing to explain. Mm. What side of his hand? Palm? Back? They'd never specify. I was just wondering if it was a defensive wound or if it was something else. I think as we get into it, you'll probably get a decent idea of why he has it. Gotcha. So police pressed on. They set up a roadblock in Ernesto's neighborhood and handed out flyers just hoping to find someone who recognized Giovanni and could give them some sort of lead. By this point, a dozen law enforcement agencies and Lynn City departments were involved in the investigation. All avenues were being investigated, and on August 20th, police brought in a helicopter with infrared equipment to search a wooded area in Lynn. Meanwhile, Daisy was trying to stay positive. She made a statement to reporters saying, quote, Giovanni, I miss you and I love you. If you see him, please bring him back home. End quote. By this time, more witnesses had come forward saying that they saw Giovanni on August 16th, the day after Daisy dropped him off. He accompanied his father to a clinic appointment. It was actually a counseling appointment. Oh, interesting. Yeah. They also searched nearby Pine Grove Cemetery with cadaver dogs, not based on any specific information or leads, but just to cover bases. They're searching a cemetery with cadaver dogs? You know, and yeah, <laughs> and I wondered the same thing because it's like the whole thing with cadaver dogs is they're real good at finding bodies. Like, so I don't right. really know how helpful that would have been. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I get it. I guess. Buried properly, they're probably not detectable. I don't know. But seems fishy i don't know <laughs> yeah now despite all of this evidence you know mounting up in in not even hard evidence but circumstantial evidence and the fact that they're bringing out cadaver dogs lynn police captain marco tool told reporters during a news conference on august 28th quote we are pursuing it that he is still alive we have nothing at this time to suggest otherwise end quote the first DNA tests actually did come back. So it was interesting because the initial DNA test did come back pretty quickly. And I don't know if it's because as this went on, um, the case just wasn't deemed as important because subsequent DNA tests took like a ridiculously long period of time. What, what was uh, what was tested? It was the mop and, um, and a few other items. Were they able to actually get? DNA off the mop after, well, after see, it that's had been what bleached? It see, that's what it sounds like. I, I actually question it because investigators said that they couldn't comment on the results, but it seems as though that if Giovanni's blood was found or if, you know, there had been usable DNA, that Captain O'Toole probably wouldn't have made the statement that says, you know, we have no reason to believe that he's not alive. Right. Daisy continued to believe that Giovanni was being held somewhere, saying, quote, I know and I have it in my heart and I feel that he is alive, end quote. So that was her theory. She didn't think that Ernesto harmed Giovanni. She thinks that he stashed him somewhere to, just to keep him from her. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask, like, for, for what purpose? That's it. Just revenge, basically. Mm. As the investigation went into September, police and Daisy tried to keep hope alive. Giovanni was featured on America's Most Wanted, and Clear Channel donated a billboard that showed photos of Giovanni and Ernesto. Nick Mech also got involved and started circulating Giovanni's photo. At this point, it was so difficult to come up with a good theory as to what Ernesto did with his son. 
On one hand, you have the police and Daisy saying he's alive. And even Ernie Allen, who was the president of NCMEC at the time, said that they believed Giovanni was alive and being held somewhere. But on the other hand, we have, you know, a bloody mop and other evidence from Ernesto's apartment. The fact that he's not talking, the fact that he has a suspicious cut on his hand and the fact that there has been no trace of Giovanni found. In addition, it turns out that Ernesto actually worked at a meat packing plant at the time. Really? Yeah. Police, again, didn't want to give specifics, but did say that they'd taken samples from his work and were testing them. To compare, one would assume, to the DNA, to the DNA that they took? Yeah, or to see if they found any human blood mm. there. Yeah. Now, it did later come out that Ernesto didn't work with knives at the meatpacking plant, but that part of his job was cleaning up the blood from the floor using hoses, foam, and wipers. Okay. So he literally cleans up blood for a living. Yikes. (laughs) Yeah. What was confounding about this case is that despite the extensive efforts of investigators, they weren't finding a lot of clues as to Giovanni's whereabouts. Giovanni was seen in Lynn with his father on the afternoon of August 16th, but he was gone without a trace just 24 hours later. Now, a lot can happen in 24 hours, I mean, granted, but Ernesto didn't have a car. Like, Mm. that's why Daisy had to drop Giovanni off and pick him up. He was also described as a loner, like he didn't have a significant other at the time or a lot of friends or family in the area. Investigators believed that Ernesto had help from someone in whatever he did with Giovanni, but they just couldn't figure out who that person could have been. Yeah. There just wasn't anybody in his life that seems like they would have helped him kidnap his son or do anything else. Mm. Jonathan Bloggett, the Essex County District Attorney, told the Boston Globe that he was convinced Giovanni was alive. He said investigators initially focused on the area that Ernesto and Giovanni could have reached by foot or mass transit because Ernesto didn't have a car. Right. um, And that they also performed multiple searches of Flax Pond, which was near the apartment. But by week three, they expanded the search beyond what he called a reasonable walking distance, you know, based on the fact that, one, they hadn't found anything, and th- based on the theory that Ernesto had an accomplice. As the investigation hit the five-week mark, Ernesto is still in jail and still refusing to talk. Reporter Yvonne Abraham interviewed Daisy for the Boston Globe. Daisy was, as you can imagine, just walking through life in a waking nightmare. She told Abraham that she hoped Ernesto would read the article, so she wanted to say something that would get his attention. She said, quote, you wanted to hurt me, and you did. It's killing me inside. But it's Giovanni's future, and he needs to show up soon. If you know where he is, or if somebody has him, just put him somewhere public, a hospital, a post office, a police station, a mall, anywhere that he can say his name and where he lives, end quote. That hope was all Daisy was holding on to, just the hope that Ernesto would do the right thing and tell her where their son was. By this time, police also publicly stated that the blood on the mop did not belong to Giovanni. So there was certainly reason to hold on to hope of a happy ending. Mm, interesting. So then I wonder whose blood it is. Yeah, I you know, I don't know if they ever tested Ernesto's blood and, you know, to determine if it was his, like maybe he had had some sort of accident or something, you right, know. No, I mean, he, he did say that he had a cut on his hand. Right, so. exactly. By mid-November, Ernesto was back in court for a short hearing. Daisy sat in the front row, and Ernesto avoided her eyes. Ernesto's lawyer filed motions to dismiss the charges against his client, saying that authorities had no evidence that Ernesto caused his child harm. I mean, yeah, sure, that's true, but where is your child then? Yeah. Like, I mean, that's the thing. The charge is child endangerment. Like, if you can't find him... That's endangerment. Right, he's still in danger. I'm no lawyer. Right. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, it seems pretty, I don't know, simple. The lawyer also claimed that the items seized from the apartment were done so without adequate legal support. Those motions were set to be heard on December 11th, 2008, and the trial was scheduled for January 13th, 2009. And keep in mind that 
at this point, he's only facing the child endangerment charges. Well, yeah, there's nothing else that they can charge him with at this point. Exactly. So they're holding all of that back and just trying to get him on this. But just over a week later, Ernesto would finally decide to talk. And he dropped a bombshell that made front page news. And before we get into it, I mean, I want to just go back to like the first time that this story took a twist, which was when Ernesto just told police that he hadn't seen Giovanni in a week, which was very easily disproven. Right. Um, during that initial interview, he's also like, yeah, no, I haven't even talked to Daisy. Like, I, I have no idea what she's talking about. Like, we haven't had contact in over a week. And police quickly found, you know, like a 20 minute phone call between Ernesto and Daisy, like either the day she dropped Giovanni off or the day before, basically making those plans. Mm -hmm. So this dude tells very like outlandish and easily disproven lies. So, you know, this is like what we know about him going into this. On November 26th, Ernesto agreed to do an interview with a Boston Globe reporter. And again, the Boston Globe heavily, heavily covered this case. And the Boston Globe is one of our country's biggest newspapers. During this interview, he confessed to stabbing his son to death and dismembering him in the bathtub in his apartment. He said that he then placed his son's remains into six plastic grocery bags and discarded them in three different trash bins in Lynn. He said that he went from trash can to trash can on his bicycle. Speaking in Spanish, Ernesto told the reporter, quote, I know where he is. My son isn't alive. He's dead. End quote. That's pretty grim. When asked why he murdered the little boy, Ernesto said that he didn't know. Quote, I didn't want to kill my son. I don't know what happened in that moment. End quote. It seemed as though this confession would mark a heartbreaking end to this case, and it would have except for the fact that police didn't believe him. Okay, explain. The Globe notified the district attorney's office of the confession, because, like, again, this was to a reporter. Right. And, like, nobody was present during this. Like, um, Ernesto's lawyer didn't even know about this interview. Mm. Until, you know, after... So the Globe contacted the DA and a senior law enforcement official who, you know, chose to remain unnamed, but was probably the DA himself, told the paper, quote, we tested that apartment completely to do what he told the reporter he did is not a plausible story. I don't know what his motive is, end quote. Well, I mean, OK. I get that they tested everything and went through the apartment but mm -hmm. you know like you said earlier this guy literally cleans up blood for a living that's right. his job yeah so don't you think it would be feasible that he would know exactly how to do just that i mean you're talking about dismembering a body in a in a bathtub which is easier to clean than anywhere else mm -hmm. right like i don't eh. yeah and when they perform the searches, they didn't have this confession. So like, I'm sure they obviously looked in the bathtub, but if right. they didn't see anything, they're not going to get like super close. Yeah. Start swabbing it with Q-tips or, or any, right. anything. Right. Cause they like had that. nothing to lead them in that direction. They had right. no reason to believe that anything had happened there. You know, same thing with anything else. Like they did a search of the apartment and when they did find things visually like the mop like this cleaner cap things like that they collected them and you know i'm sure they looked closely around those items right because like they had that direction to go in but yeah i mean right but they didn't do like any luminol testing of the of the tub or anything like that like you said because there was no reason for them to think that something had happened there right whether or not they were taking his confession at face value, it at least provided investigators with a new direction in the case. So then they did go back and they tested the drains in the apartment and ordered new tests on the cat from the household cleaner. 
Authorities said that they weren't completely discounting the confession, but made it clear that they were still investigating and that they wanted to compare Ernesto's account to the physical evidence. Okay. I mean, uh, yeah. Exactly. Sure. Which is, that makes which sense. is totally good because, and that's the, and this is going off a little bit on a tangent, but like, that's the problem that I have with, uh, you know, prosecutions that are basically based solely on like witness statements, especially when we get to jailhouse snitches. It's like, like, that's great. If you have a witness saying that they know that this person killed that person or did whatever, perfect. But like, you need to have some evidence to go along with that statement. Right. You know? And, um, and yeah, so that's what they wanted because they know that this guy just makes shit up and they didn't want to just give up searching for this little boy if he was still out there because some liar told them another lie. Yeah, I mean, good on good on law enforcement for for doing that. The full account that Ernesto gave the reporter was very detailed. He said that Giovanni had been, quote, behaving badly all weekend. On Sunday, August 17th, around 10.38 a.m., he said that they were both in the kitchen and that Giovanni was standing in front of the refrigerator and yelling. The next thing he knew, he was stabbing the little boy with a red-handled kitchen knife. He also said that he put the six grocery bags into a black and gold duffel bag with the word rollerblades on it. He even told the reporter the three locations that he disposed of the bags, a stone church near Lynn Common, at a Big Lots, and behind a store on Union Street near an eastern bank. He then said that he washed the knife and returned it to the drawer. Unfortunately, apparently those trash bins weren't emptied at a dump when they those trash bins were emptied, at least one of them. It sounded like all of them. This part was unclear, but the contents were incinerated instead of taken to a landfill. What the hell? I don't know, man. I don't know what they do in Boston. So at this point, really, people did not know what to think. This was a detailed and plausible confession but according to investigators, the physical evidence didn't support it. However, Ernesto's history did, at least somewhat. In 2001, he was arrested after a fight with his then-girlfriend in which he threatened her with a knife and used the knife to vandalize her car. He then threatened neighbors with the knife when they tried to intervene and even threatened police officers with the knife after they arrived. He was convicted of multiple assault and battery charges and spent three months in jail. But despite this, he had no history of violence toward Giovanni or any of his other children, as I mentioned. That seems to be like the only, you know, violent thing that he had had a, a run in with the law about. But the fact that it was with a knife doesn't, you know, make me feel good. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely commonalities, obviously. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that doesn't lend itself to being like his complete history. No, not at all. Despite them not completely believing Ernesto's confession, the DA slapped more charges on him, including misleading police and parental kidnapping. Again, they just, they still weren't ready to do the murder charges, but they didn't want to just have the child endangerment either. So the new ones carried a combined potential sentence of 11 years. In January of 2009, Ernesto pleaded not guilty to those charges. The Globe tried to get the results of the search warrant that police executed after his confession, but the judge unsurprisingly suppressed that information. Daisy also spoke publicly for the first time since the confession and said that she didn't believe Ernesto. She still believed that Giovanni was alive and that someone in Lynn saw something. So I'm still, okay, so yeah. he, he pleads not guilty to these other charges. But what was his motivation for confessing? Like he he just he wanted to get it off of his chest. Yeah, basically. I mean, at, I think at one point he did say that like he didn't think he was going to get out of prison anyway, and so he just wanted to tell them what happened. August seventeenth, two thousand nine, marked one year since Giovanni was last seen. His father remained in Essex County Jail, locked down for 23 hours a day in a special unit. This was, again, a pretty high-profile case, and so, yeah, they did not uh, think that putting him in gen pop would be a good idea for his personal safety. After his confession the previous November, Ernesto stopped talking once again. So he, he 
gave that confession to the reporter, but like never at any point talked to law enforcement and told them anything. So, I mean, it's out there, but they can't really use it as like a sworn statement or anything like that. Exactly. Yeah. It's not a sworn statement at all. All it's really doing is, like I said before, giving them a direction to take the investigation. Right. And Which, again, we don't know whether it was to cloud the investigation or whether it was actually true. Yeah. We don't know. And, you know, part of the reason he's not talking after this confession is because, as you can imagine, his lawyer freaked out on him. Yeah. And told him to shut up. Right. Which is what a defense lawyer is supposed to do. Essex DA Jonathan Blodgett reaffirmed his office's dedication to the case, saying, quote, this whole investigation, we're sparing no effort, no expense, end quote. But nearly eight months after Ernesto's confession, they were still awaiting lab results on the items taken from Ernesto's apartment. So that's kind of like what I was talking about in terms of the speed. And as I'm going through this timing again, you know, now that we're talking about it, I have a sneaking suspicion that the reason why we got the uh, results so quickly the first time wasn't because you know, they thought this case was so important. It's because they couldn't test the DNA from the mop. And it wasn't that Giovanni's blood wasn't on the mop. The, it's the that tests were probably inconclusive. They couldn't test it. Right. And so that's why, and they were able to figure that out pretty quickly. And so that's why we got those answers. And, and I honestly, I don't think that they completed testing on the cap mm. at that time. And I think that now that Ernesto confessed, they're like, oh, shit, like we really do have to like test anything that we can right. from this apartment because now we have like a good reason to believe that something very bad happened there. And so that's why I think that, you know, it's eight months after this confession and we still don't have the results, whereas we got the first quote unquote results within a week. Right. And they didn't specifically say what the results of the test were. Like they didn't say it was. Not at the time. They refused to comment. It, But later, and I forget how much, if it was weeks, if it was months, whatever, they said, oh yeah, it wasn't Giovanni's blood. But that was prior to the confession. So I don't know if the person who said that really knew, you know, right? Like right. they could have just been misinformed, you know, because the tests were inconclusive. They could have just taken that to mean that it wasn't his blood or, you know what I mean? Like, right, yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Ernesto's attorney waived his client's right to a speedy trial pending the outcome of those DNA tests, though. So the months continued to go by unabated. In January of 2010, a competency hearing was held. Because basically, uh, it seems as though his mental health was declining. Oh, weird. You mean after spending almost a year in 23-hour lockdown? Yeah, I don't know if he was still in 20, because they did take him out of that at some point, but he had been in jail at this point for a year and a half. Ernesto Gonzalez was found to be fit to stand trial for his alleged role in his son's disappearance. And like I said, it had been a year and a half since Daisy had seen her oldest child. And, you know, at that point, she just wanted answers. She said that she didn't care if Ernesto or anyone else who was involved in Giovanni's disappearance spent another day in jail. Like she wasn't out for vengeance she would have happily let Ernesto walk out a free man. She just wanted her son back and she still believed that he was alive. But by April of that year, the chances of Giovanni coming home lessened even more when some new evidence came out. In April of 2010, it was reported that Giovanni's blood was found in Ernesto's apartment. On the cap? Yep, on the cap. It was also found on a piece of wood flooring, the bathroom threshold, and on a knife with a red handle. So his confession was true. It certainly or seems. Or at least it seems that way. Yeah. I mean, the physical evidence that they wanted to match up is matching up. Nevertheless, Daisy wasn't dissuaded. She said that Giovanni often bled from cuts he was sustained while playing, and she didn't want this new evidence to stop people from searching for her son. 
it's understandable yeah. that she's saying that it's, uh, you know, a mother that's clearly distraught. But, you know, I mean, the evidence is what it is. Yeah. It's just a horrible, horrible fucking situation. And Daisy did continue to search on her own. She even traveled to Puerto Rico to speak with Ernesto's family. And that was one of the leads or theories, I should say, that was investigated early on. Um, So Ernesto is from Puerto Rico, but he did grow up in Lynn. And so he still has family back there. And so one of the theories is that Giovanni had been sent to Puerto Rico and was kind of being hidden out there. Daisy told the Globe, quote, his mother has a very important role here. Maybe what he is looking for is a way to talk to his mother, and maybe through her, he can unburden himself and talk. He is always asking for her. She is the key, end quote. Apparently, Ernesto's mother, Lydia, had not spoken to her son for years prior to Giovanni's disappearance. Other family members also asked Lydia to return to Massachusetts and try to get information out of Ernesto, but she refused. She said that he didn't need his mother in order to tell the truth, but she did say that she would visit one day when she was ready. A reporter actually traveled down to Puerto Rico and interviewed Lydia as well as Ernesto's sister. And, you know, Ernesto's sister was also estranged from their mother, despite living close by in Puerto Rico. She said, she was like, yeah, I still, he's, you know, Giovanni isn't here. Like, I really wish people would stop saying that like we had nothing to do with anything we have not seen i've never met this child you know we don't know um but ernesto has never been violent like he's had issues he's had drug issues and you know things like that but she's like it doesn't seem like him to hurt a child especially his child and um the mother of his oldest child who was like 18 at the time was also interviewed And she kind of said the same thing. She's like, listen, he's not the greatest father, but, you know, he sent me money. And like, again, this is not something that I would have seen coming at all. So, you know, I don't know. But it really did seem to come out of the blue for the people who knew him. The wheels of justice continued to turn slowly. In June of 2011, a Superior Court judge dismissed the parental kidnapping charge. This actually did make some sense. Um just based on the way the law is written, because a judge hadn't formally taken custody from Ernesto, it wasn't legally parental kidnapping. Okay. And, you know, you can disagree with that on a, like a moral level, of course. Sure. But, but again, it, based well, on the way the law is written, yeah. the ruling makes sense to me. I mean, have they charged him with murder at this point? No. They have not yet. Now, fortunately, but weirdly, um, the other thing about that charge, the parental kidnapping, was uh, that was one of the minor charges against him. It only carried a potential one-year sentence in the county jail, whereas the other charge uh, that he was given at the same time, misleading the police, carried 10 years in state prison. (laughs) (laughs) Because that was seen as the more serious infraction. Really? Yes. Lying to the cops. Right. Jesus. So that's slightly infuriating. In the end, the prosecutors appealed this decision, the dismissal of the parental kidnapping charges. And in 2012, the charge was reinstated by a higher court. But by that point, Ernesto had already been in jail for nearly four years. And in 2012, when the parental kidnapping charge was reinstated, he still hadn't been charged with murder, despite his confession and the blood evidence from his apartment. And this is one of those cases where you think about all these like wrongfully convicted people who had been convicted on so much less. Right. Yes. That's why this is blowing my mind that yeah. they haven't slapped a murder charge on him. Yeah. Like, like I get it after, you know, the confession with the Globe reporter, like, okay, that's easily, you know, whatever. But then you have the physical evidence right. that matches up with it, which is what they said they were looking for, which is what they should have been looking for. Like, what the hell else do they want? I mean, they want a body, to be sure. Sure. But, but I mean, plenty of cases. Put this in front of a jury. Yeah. With the physical evidence. It, it, and it may not even go to a jury trial. If he's already confessed once, if you put a murder charge, maybe he's 
pleading not guilty to those other charges because, like, you know, he didn't do that. He didn't kidnap his kid. Right, right. But maybe you put a murder charge on him, and what if, since he already confessed, what if he, what if he pleads guilty to that? Yeah, no idea. Like, what the hell? No, it's it's a little bit baffling to me at that point. So as time continued to pass, Ernesto is still in jail. Like, he's still in the county jail, just, you know, cool in his heels. And during that time, he was charged with assaulting his cellmate. With a red-handled knife? <laughs> no, this is... Uh, also pretty brutal, though. He allegedly smashed the man's head against a metal sink, breaking bones in his face and injuring his right eye. Not a violent person, though. Well, that's what I'm saying. So we really, as the years go on, his mental health is clearly declining. And we just keep on seeing more and more instances of that. And this is one. After this, and and just because of everything else that's been going on with him, you know, more investigation has been done into his past, just from the prison standpoint, or the jail standpoint, I should say, not even in terms of like this investigation into his son's disappearance. So court records also revealed that Ernesto had overdosed on a combination of Advil and Tylenol four months prior to Giovanni's disappearance. And this is something that Daisy didn't know about that really nobody had known about. And it sounds like even though Ernesto refused to say what that um, counseling appointment was about the day before Giovanni disappeared, it seems more likely that it was related to this than like anger management counseling or something related to, you know, what Daisy had asked for him back in 2007. It was also determined that Ernesto had a history of torturing cats as a child. Jesus, really? Yeah. And again, this just didn't come out until they started digging into his psychological background because he was having all of these problems in jail. But even more than that, he had actually confessed to his son's murder a second time. Is this a jailhouse informant? Nope, but he did confess in jail, but he confessed to Daisy. Apparently, she visited him in jail shortly after Giovanni's disappearance and before he confessed to the reporter, because just a few weeks after, she was convinced that she had seen Giovanni with a man in Lynn. Like, she said that she was driving around Lynn and she saw a man on a hill with Giovanni and she stopped the car. She ran after them and just like panicked and froze and just lost them basically and couldn't like she panicked and like couldn't yell out his name you know and then he was gone so she went to go visit Ernesto in jail and said like hey I saw him like you know thinking again that he was right who did you give him to exactly right was the guy that had him yeah and so that's exactly what she was asking but according to court documents Ernesto replied that it was impossible that she saw Giovanni because their son was dead and you said he said this to her before he gave him. the interview with a reporter. Yeah. But Daisy didn't want to hear it. She didn't believe him. During a hearing in December of 2011, Ernesto shouted that he wanted to plead guilty. Like, literally shouted in open court. To, to murder? Yeah. Or, you know, not to murder. I mean, just to the charges that, like, he was there for, I guess. But just in general, really. His new attorney, you know, so by this time, he had, he was already on a different attorney. Um, he asked for the state to pay for a psychological evaluation because they're like, you know, this dude having some issues, like we need to really figure out what's going on here. The psychologist who examined Ernesto said that he claimed that a judge, two previous lawyers and a corrections officer had sexually abused him. OK, well, that's not true. Yeah. And he also claimed that a lawyer stole $2,000 out of his pocket. Also not true. You yeah. can't have money. Yeah. I mean, and much less likely than, <laughs> than, you know, whatever. But anyway, none of that's true. You're right. So the psychologist recommended that Ernesto be sent to a psychiatric hospital and be prescribed antipsychotics. But, you know, Ernesto instead was returned to jail. Then, in December of 2012, 
Ernesto allegedly punched and bit a corrections officer. The next day, Ernesto was remanded to Bridgewater, the prison psychiatric hospital. Weird. Yeah. So we're talking December 2012 by this point. Four and a half years almost after the disappearance. We've got no murder charges. And, you know, we have two confessions. Granted, none of them sworn confessions, but still two confessions. We have physical evidence and nothing. I do understand at this point why the DA wouldn't want to charge him because they weren't sure of his mental status. And they it makes sense for them to want to kind of figure all of that out before they start a trial. Sure. So in May of 2013, another competency hearing was held. And on October 3rd of that year, a judge ruled that Ernesto Gonzalez was not competent to stand trial. The defense pushed to have the charges against him dismissed due to the finding of of incompetence and the fact that he had already served over half of the maximum sentence for the charges filed against him. A hearing was held in November, and on December 5th, 2013, over five years after his arrest for parental kidnapping and misleading police, the charges against Ernesto Gonzalez were dropped. Part of the judge's decision read, quote, This court has examined very recent mental health records. They all support a finding of not competent. The records state that Mr. Gonzalez continues to endorse command auditory hallucinations to kill himself and others, end quote. And Massachusetts does have a statute where like that is actually codified where if you're found incompetent and you've you've served over half of your sentence, like they say that the charges should be dismissed. Sure. Over half of the sentence for the charges that were levied against him. Correct. Misleading the police being the one with the longest sentence. What's the longest sentence for murder? Well, yeah, you know, good question. and. The charges being dropped did not mean that Ernesto was free to go. No, I get that. But still, like, that would have changed. If he had been charged with murder, Yeah, that would have changed the outcome of the judge's decision. Because he wouldn't have had, have spent more than half of... Well, yes. Yes and no, right? So, yes he wouldn't have had all charges dropped against him, but no, he likely would have still had those charges dropped, right? And then he only would have been left with a murder charge. But functionally, it stayed kind of the same. So Ernesto was civilly committed to Bridgewater until May of 2014, and the hospital was already trying to extend that. He also still had the assault charges from jail hanging out there. So from his cellmate and the CO, and they weren't charging him with those because they were waiting to see all of the competency, yeah, competency stuff. Yeah. And and again, that's, I think, also why they weren't charging him with murder at this point. But, you know, all of this was cold comfort to Daisy, who just wanted Ernesto to tell her where their son was. Ernesto remained in Bridgewater, and in 2016, another competency hearing was held. He was found competent, and in 2017, he stood trial for assault and witness intimidation. And the, so the assault was, I don't know if it was both of those incidences, if it was only one or what it was. I don't know about the witness intimidation charge. That has never been brought up in any of the articles that I read, but I did find the court records for it. But in July of 2017, he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. And that's the end of it, from what it seems. So was he released? No. So he's still in Bridgewater? As far as I know, he still remains under psychiatric care in Bridgewater, but I don't have any more answers. And I couldn't find any court records Beyond 2017. Wow. I couldn't find any news articles beyond 2016. I didn't even find a news article about him being found not guilty in 2017. I literally just only found that in the court records. Wow. Yeah. The last news article that I have been able to find on this was in 2016 when they held that competency hearing. So I have no idea. This story just completely fell off the map from what I've been able to find. 
So if anybody knows anything about this after 2017, like, please let me know. Because again, like, I could not find a single thing. There's no statute of limitations on murder. Right. So I understand that why after he's found not guilty by reason of insanity um, for these assaults that the DA wouldn't want to bring the murder charges because they don't want him to be found, found not guilty. Right. But I don't know what's happening, right? Like, you know, there are no further competency hearings scheduled to my knowledge. And I don't know what the status is. So Blodgett is still the DA of Essex, Essex County. It's still the same guy. So this isn't even a situation where like there's a new DA who's not even that familiar with the case and it's just not on their radar. Like this is the guy who has been involved in this case since 2008. So like what, I mean, what is he waiting on? I don't know because again, like it would make sense to me if he was waiting for him to be declared competent and for him to feel confident that they could have a trial where a jury could come to a guilty or not guilty verdict based on the evidence and right. not his mental competency. Right. But Why in order to get to that point, we need, need to have the competency hearings. Yes. And to my knowledge, there has not been one since 2016. I mean, that's six years ago. That's yeah. longer than if Ernesto did murder his son. That is longer than Giovanni was alive. Yeah. And I haven't found anything on Daisy. I don't know where she is, if she's still in East Boston. I don't know what happened to her. She has not spoken to reporters since, I mean, gosh, I think the last thing I found was before 2016 on her. It might have even been like 2013 or something. I don't know. I don't know what she thinks. I don't know what she feels. I mean, I'm sure, you know, she still is tortured by this every single day of her life, of course. But I, I don't know. Like, there's just no good ending here or good answers or anything. And it's like, if you take Ernesto's confession at face value and what physical evidence we have does support it, then it doesn't seem as though there's a chance of ever finding Giovanni. So there's never going to be the closure in that regard. Right. And so I don't know if Daisy still believes that he's alive out there somewhere, but it sounds like there's nothing physical that will be able to convince her otherwise. And so it just doesn't seem like she's going to get any sort of resolution one way or the other. So regardless of whether or not Ernesto ever stands trial, Daisy is always going to be stuck in a limbo. I mean, this whole thing is just horribly sad, but that's the thing. Like, she'll never get the answers she needs. Giovanni was a sweet little boy who just wanted a dad in his life. Ernesto was a troubled man who, through a combination of rage and mental illness, likely ended his youngest child's life. But despite his confession and despite the evidence, Daisy Cologne still believes or at least she did the last time she spoke to reporters, that her little boy, who would be 19 now, is out there somewhere. Quote, I have not lost faith on that at all. I know my son is somewhere. I know my son is going to show up one day with the help of the justice system or without their help. End quote. Giovanni Colon Gonzalez has been missing from Lynn, Massachusetts since August 16, 2008. He is a Hispanic male with brown hair and brown eyes. He has a small scar above his right eyebrow, a small birthmark on the inside of his left ankle, and a faded skin pigmentation mark on the lower right side of his chest. He is of Puerto Rican descent. Giovanni was 4 foot 1 and 40 pounds at the time of his disappearance. He was 5 years old when he went missing. He would be 19 today. If you have any information regarding the disappearance of Giovanni Colon Gonzalez, you can contact the Lynn Police Department at 
595-2000. You can see all of the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social, and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research writing and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. 